Um, just a little bit of uh, a divided talk into two, looking at uh, the latest um, trends in the training side for drilling and blasting. Um, so the, how we've modularized that, some of the unique things we've done with that. Uh, and then talking, you've heard a lot about Quinjack, and we're going to hit some more about Quinjack, and Roy's just turned up to make sure I talk about Quinjack. Uh, particularly focusing on one particular unit and how that's kind of driven things and uh, technology. Okay, so you, I, I guess, looking around the room, many of you have been on an EPC shop firing course, uh, and we've been doing that for many, many, many years. Uh, in the last couple of years, we've put a huge amount of effort into modularizing those courses and bringing them uh, right up to date. Uh, and in fact, we've now got somewhere in the region of 40 different modules relating to explosives. So we have some core modules, which we use in all our courses. So they are general generic explosives modules. So if you came along to us and did a shot firing in miscellaneous mines, for example, you'd get these course, these modules, you'd get them in shot firing. And we have some quarrying specific modules for the shot firing course and the explosive supervisors course. I mentioned un underground mining. We've probably trained as many people in underground mining in the last year as we have in quarrying. So quite an incredible number in the last year. Uh, and we also have bespoke courses. So bespoke modules. For example, we have a bespoke modules for Rolls-Royce. You might wonder what the hell is Rolls-Royce doing with explosives. That's Rolls-Royce aero engines, and they use explosives in the testing process in Derby. So we do their training for that, about handling explosives. And in fact, I probably think now, looking back for the last year, we've probably trained more people in handling explosives than any other topic. So that's the way they all fit together. We've got the core modules in the middle, and then the quarrying ones that you'd be familiar with, shot firing and the supervisors. And then on the side that you probably know nothing about, we have underground mining. We have the basic handling course. Um, as a matter of interest, all the people who work for EPC on the explosive side uh, all go through that training, from the senior management right down to the bottom. And then we have the bespoke courses. So that's miscellaneous mines and, and various other types of courses. So those are the, the modules. It's fooling me what's on the screen, and I'm going to have to keep turning around. So there's our core modules. Shot firing for surface mining and quarrying. The explosive supervisors, we have the three sections there. We have the blast design. We have the safety and legislation. Uh, and we have the environmental impact. So they're now all modularized and updated. I just thought I'd describe to you just one fairly unique module, which is, has no PowerPoint slides whatsoever, and it's our live firing experience. One of the issues I think the industry has recognized over the years is complacency. And one of the issues we identified with our own workforce, and certainly other people's workforce as well, is that people forget what explosives can do. So we have a module that's specifically related to firing, live firing of explosives, and we're fortunate that we can do that, of course, because we have an explosives factory and a firing ground that's licensed for open detonation. So we can take explosives that people would use every day and show them what happens if it goes wrong, if it fires in the air, for example. It's a very powerful thing. I think if you speak to anybody who's been on a recent shot firing course, the one thing they will remember is the live firing experience. So for the quarrying sector, we fire a single detonator in a can, both a shock tube and an electric detonator two meters of detonating cord in the air, 400 grams of cartridge explosives in the air. Uh, we, they fire a shock tube delay pattern. Uh, there's an electronic detonator demonstration. And the grand finale is general are two and a half kilograms fired underwater in the pond, which if they're standing downwind, they all get wet afterwards. And people are always astonished. I, often, I always ask people, how high do you reckon the water is going to go? and they always get it wrong. No one, no one ever can guess how high it's going to go. I think we've got some videos here. This is the two meters of detonating cord. The cartridge explosives.
just a little bit different. This is an underground part from the underground mining course. These are LP detonators, long period detonators, so very long delays in some of them. So long delay detonators for tunneling. This is our uh, electronic demonstration where we play a tune which amuses people. Some people now have that as a ringtone. <laughs> yes. And then the pawn shop. So that's the live firing exercise. And just as an example of bespoke courses, uh, companies come along to us occasionally, ISG in this case, it's a, a, a project management uh, consultancy in London, managing a project in Finland, uh, which involves the use of explosives close to a sensitive location. Um, asked us if we could help. We said, well, here's the menu of modules. Which bits do you want? So they chose some from the core, some from the shot firing course, and some from the supervisor's course. We just check that the prerequisites are all OK, and then off they go, and they have that course uh, on site in Finland. We have a module on personal safety. Um, and this is uh, an interesting module, uh, and it's, we've actually spent quite a lot of money in generating media to go with this. Some of you would have seen some of the media. Um, and we also have slides, for example, on, in this case, air blast. Um, not air blast from a quarry blast, but from open detonation. So if you were to fire a primer in the air, for example, on your quarry to dispose of it, you can use this chart to look up how far away you need to be, what protection you need to be at, what distances. So people can use this chart. And all the safety type information we don't mind providing to people. There's the uh, famous don't be a dummy with explosives part, which was started off as part of that uh, module. And it's now metamorphosed, or is that the right word, into a Quinjet toolbox tool which hopefully will be approved for, for publication. It's currently awaiting approval. And one of the bits of video that we generated for that was our shop dummy strangely pointing a detonator at her face, and then we videoed it. So you can see the amount of shrapnel involved in, in a detonator firing. So then on to, we've metamorphosed into Quinjack. More about Quinjack. Um, Quinjack is a working group which focuses on specific issues related to drilling and blasting, and I have the great pleasure of being the chairman of that group. Uh, and we have members from the health and safety executive, quarry operators, suppliers, and also contractors, drilling and blasting contractors. So we have a good range of representation. Uh, and the main output from that Quinjack group is in the form of toolbox talks, uh, but our biggest issue, and it would be a plea to everyone in the room, is actually us identifying, uh, inf getting information on near misses, near hits. Um, we kind of get information back, but we don't get it on a regular enough basis. So the 10 toolbox talks that have been produced Positioning the shot firing shelter. Roy had that on his presentation earlier on. We're going to come back to that one in a minute. Loading and unloading of drill rigs and compressors. Blast site edge protection. Danger zone control and duty of sentries. For some reason this one appears twice. It was so good. Post blast inspection. Fires on explosives vehicles. I think the people that have seen that one has made a big impact on the way they operate and the way they think about emergency procedures. Thunderstorms, risks and actions. Post-blast fumes. It's circled, it's in red because this one's yet to be published, but it's on its way. It's in its final form. Uh, and then this don't be a dummy with explosives. So all of those will be available on Quinjack website and safe quarry. So the first toolbox talk that we produced um, was on the positioning of a shot firing shelter and this was the direct result of lessons from an incident where the shot firer had I think both his legs broken, I seem to remember, um, 
from a rock falling from a face and coming in through the door of the shot firing shelter and, and breaking his legs. It's a very serious incident and that was, we then took that on, what can we do about it? We'll make this the first toolbox talk. So there it is, positioning a shot firing shelter. So simple guidance, um, what should a shot firing shelter look like? So we got this example of good practice from aggregate industries as an illustration of what makes a good shot firing shelter. Where should it be positioned? Seems obvious really, don't put it on the edge of the face, but some guidance there. Also some guidance about how close to the toe of a face it should be. Then there's one interesting slide that we put in, almost not as an afterthought, but it was just, we put it in. Um, and that's this slide. And it says, can you fire from outside of the danger zone? Clearly this is the best option. Uh, if you can, you don't need a shelter, um, you, but you will need a remote firing system. And this option gives you greatly enhanced control over the danger zone. Now, at the time, there was one remote firing system available, but it was incredibly expensive. Uh, but as soon as this toolbox talk came out, there was then a demand from industry saying, well, OK, where's these remote firing systems? Um, just a little picture just to show you how good, if you're standing there, you get fantastic control over the danger zone looking into the quarry. Have someone standing on the far side who can look back under the faces where you are. You've got complete control of the blast area without the need for a sh shot firing shelter. So as soon as that came out, quarry people were saying, we want remote firing. Uh, suppliers then develop it. Uh, and the blast operations are safer as a result. And there are now systems available for shock tube. This is the one we supply here. Uh, as an electric debt version. And all the electronic de detonator systems that are available now come with the option for remote firing. So having that, just that one slide, I think, has helped just push things on and make things safer, which is great. So with our electronic debt system, we have a, a remote firing system. So effectively two exploders connected by a radio, secure radio link. I thought I'd show you a little bit of an amusing video to go with it. This is, you can see the aerial here. The blast area is in there. And this is on the staircase which leads up into the quarry manager's office. Uh, and I'm videoing it. And people always forget what they're doing, don't they, when you're videoing things and the fact that if they talk or say things, you get the recording. So you'll hear some sound on the speakers. I bleeped out the, some of it, not bleeped it out, but silenced it. But we call it remote firing with customer feedback. <laughs> I've done to that, yeah? Where? Me. That's the real McCoy, that. <laughs> so remote firing is available for all systems. And, it, and it, it, when people start to use it, they really are enthusiastic about it because for the first time, the shot firer can actually see the blast they're firing and they've got complete control over the danger zone. They don't have to rely on other people controlling it for them. Just looking at the future, Certainly the systems that we use, that's what the future looks like. It looks a bit strange, to be honest, but uh, that's the base station for the electronic debt system of the future. And then one and a half kilometres away, you can have another similar one on a bench. And each of those can be connected to four channels of 300 detonators. So you can fire remotely 1,200 detonators. So if anybody wants to do that, I'm up for that. And even better you can put 10 of them in parallel and fire 12,000 detonators on one button press. So I'm really up for that if anybody wants to do it. And I think, and, and finally, as they say, we're standing in the Reox Stadium here. That's what used to be here. Uh, and it was demolished with the use of explosives. So I thought it was quite appropriate to, to see what was here before and the fact that explosives contributed to the Reco Stadium. Okay, that's it. I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. Silence, excellent.
It's lunchtime.